Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for, for tuning in. Uh, my name is Sabrina. I'm Kubra. I'm Chance. Uh, we're here on behalf of the Hamilton Center for Civic Inclusion, and we're super, super excited uh, for this, this evening's conversation. Um, uh, we are in HCCI, we are hosting from uh, the traditional territories of the Erie, the neutral Hornwanda, the Haudenosaunee, Mississaugas of the Credit, and this land is covered by the District 1 Spoon Wampum Belt uh, Covenant. And in this particular moment, and what we want to talk about today and center this conversation around is what it means to resist settler states and affirm Indigenous sovereignty here, but, but also across the world. Uh, this book, Border and Rule by, by Harshawali, it talks a lot about nation states and borders and how people are made illegal because of colonial and white supremacist ideologies and policy. Uh, she talks about how the law constructs illegality while racism constructs the illegal and this sort of entrenches this intrinsic relationship uh, between settler and colonial states as well as racism and how they rely upon each other to create what we now call Canada. Uh, so when we give this uh, land acknowledgement, we're recognizing that sovereignty uh, and the struggle against colonialism, white supremacy, dispossession is a global struggle uh, for migrants and for indigenous people across the world. Uh, and to center this here locally as well, we're thinking of um, land defenders uh, at uh, Six Nations who've been resisting land theft and the, uh, the building of uh, and developments um, for the past year and a half. Um, yeah, thank you so much for, for tuning in and passing in the pass it over to Chance. So yeah, today we are very, very excited we have a very special guest coming to speak with us today, and we are very, very honored to have her. Harsha Walia is an activist um, and a writer based in Vancouver, BC. She has been involved with many groups like No One Is Illegal, the February 14th Women's Memorial Church Committee, the Downtown Eastside Women's Center, and several Downtown Eastside Housing Justice Coalition. Uh, today we will be speaking about her book. She is the author of Border and Rule, Global Migration, Capitalism, and the Rise of Racist Nationalism. And within this book, Harsha provides an urgent and very much needed global analysis of capitalism, global migration, and nationalism in a way that is really unprecedented, uh, providing the information in a striking manner. Border and Rule equips the readers with the harsh realities of how the state came to be and continues to enforce, enforce violence against migrants workers and racialized people in the deport spora. Harsha has another book called Undoing Border Imperialism that has come out in 2013. Um, and so Harsha is a true expert and provides a revolutionary voice that is needed to push this movement forward. And we are so, so happy to introduce you all to Harsha Walia. Hi. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Good to see you all. Good to see you. Thank you for being here and, and having this discussion with us today. Oh, I'm so excited. And thank you all for your incredible work. Just hands raised for all the good work you all are doing and throwing down. So I'm so happy to support. Thank you. Thank you. We wanted to kind of give you the chance to talk a bit about your book and, and um, you know, before we start off with like with questions or anything like that, like what, what do you have to say about border and rule and about um, kind of the process and, and and, and the content of, of this fantastic um, book. Um, yeah, I should say, so I'm on the uh, unceded territories of the Coast Salish people. I'm on the lands of the Musqueam, the Suela Tooth, and the Squahomish Nations. Uh, and similar to what you described uh, that's happening on Six Nations land, uh, I just want to, you know, right now mention that uh, in Wet'suwet'en territory, who have, of course, been facing down pipeline threats for decades, uh, and last year was the incredibly mil heavily militarized raid on Wet'suwet'en territory and the shutdown Canada mobilizations that shut down Canada last year. Um, Gidimdem Checkpoint and Wet'suwet'en Nation are currently under the threat of drilling by Coastal Gas Link. And so there's a number of Indigenous land defenders um, who have locked down to drilling equipment. Um, and so, you know, as you pointed out in the introduction, you know, thinking about borders within the context of settler colonialism is so necessary because 
of course, one of the things that borders do is to create artificial divides on Turtle Island, right? To separate indigenous peoples on these nations and really around the world. Um, for me, writing Border and Rule, I'll be brief because the book is very dense, um, but I pr primarily wrote this book uh, as someone who's organized and with personal experience with borders um, and who's organized for decades. Um, and so the books are in kind of a strange reverse chronological order where the first book, Undoing Border Imperialism, really is about movement organizing. Um, and the second book is, uh, a, is an attempt to think about borders in like a global context because one thing I've found is, you know, in Canada, for example, it's always like, oh, well, we're better than the U.S. Or, you know, in the U.S., it's like, we're the worst ever. Um, and so I really wanted to have an international, historical, uh, kind of global, as much as that's possible, um, analysis about how borders are really a function of imperialism. It's not about, like, which nation, state, you know, is Canada better or worse than the United States and, like, these, you know, empires fighting it out about who's more racist or who's better, but to really think about how borders travel and bordering mm -hmm. systems travel and that they can't be separated from white supremacy, anti-blackness, indigenous elimination and empire. Um, and also that a lot of times we think about immigrant rights in this kind of really global, I mean, in this really kind of local context, right? Like, um, you know, Justin Trudeau's multicultural rhetoric of refugees welcome without talking about imperialism, right? Like talking about, the US and Canada and Europe's long imperial history of Haiti, for example, which is playing out right now on the US-Mexico border, or talking about you know, Canada's role in Afghanistan when talking about what's going on in Afghanistan, or you know, just so many places. Um, we talk about refugees welcome in this kind of multicultural benevolent framework without implicating these long ongoing historic and contemporary relationships of empire and imperialism. So part of writing Bordering Rule is also to shift from like that narrative of, you know, rights or charity or refugees welcome to reparations, to revolution, to restitution, um, and to think about how we're connected in this as a, as a global structure of violence. So there's a lot more I'll say, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. And to really understand borders in this continuum of, of carceral regimes, right? Of like mm -hmm. state control. Right. And I think that's great that you, that you started off there because I think that's exactly where our first question um, what was we were we were aiming for is you know what this book really did well was call out um, you know what we now, now call Canada's position and role in the violence that is global and how uh, you know it is revered as this multicultural hub and it unveils that um, as especially in the, the myth of the multicultural uh, chapter within the book um, and you know and we talked about how you know people talked about the Syrian refugee crisis, especially in 2015, and there was this false narrative that Canada was um, accepting, you know, a, a proportion of any of these refugees that really would have um, been substantial or re really um, done something that was, you know, out of true intention. Um, and so our first question was, you know, how has Canada gotten away with pushing forward this narrative of a multicultural identity and how have they gotten away with it for so long that's something that we couldn't something that we couldn't get over reading this mm. book something that we talked about um is how how has it gotten uh to to be this and to have this false identity and to be so accepted on a global scale and how have they gotten away with that for so long oh that's an excellent question um, you know, I'd say in, in popular consciousness, my read of it, <laughs> um, you know, not a like, not a historical read, but just like in that kind of popular cultural realm, I think Canada really rides off the coattails of like not being the United States. It really comes down to that, right? Of being like, just whenever things are bad, point down south, you know, whenever there's escalations of white supremacy, we know white supremacy isn't new. Of course, it's like baked into the foundations of settler colonialism and enslavement and empire in this country. But whenever we see the escalation of white supremacy, then it's very easy to say, oh, it's just, you know, an export of Trump, right? Like this is just the United States exporting uh, its white terrorist, you know, or its white supremacist kind of um, ideologies. And so it becomes a really easy way. Or, you know, whenever Canada's at war to say like, oh, well, we didn't send as many troops as the United States did. Um, so really a lot of it is just being able to constantly point to the United States um, and of course, you know, so many black organizers and black scholars like, you know, Robin Maynard, whose entire body of work is about how a big part of anti-blackness and Ronaldo Walcott's work and Dionne Brand 
about how anti-blackness in Canada, for example, really is evaded. Um, by just being able to, you know, point to what's happening in the United States even right now, right, with anti-black police violence or anti-blackness writ large. So I think a lot of it is that. Um, the other part is, I think, structural, which is that uh, Canada has built in very particular immigration policies that makes it seem that Canada is welcoming to immigrants, right? And so one of the things that Canada does is very much flaunt um, a refugee policy is being very benevolent around the world. And also the kind of immigration system is being really benevolent around the world. When in fact, Canada's immigration system, whether it's the, you know, what we used to know as the point system in the 70s and 80s, where immigrants literally got points for how closely they could assimilate. You know, what languages did you speak? Um, what post-secondary education you have? Like all of these markers really of proximity to a particular racial class. Um, or right now, Canada's migrant worker program, you know, where it seems like Canada's accepting lots of immigrants, but it's really temporary migrant workers who are cheap into labor doing, you know, some of the hardest work, who are experiencing some of the highest fatalities during the pandemic. Um, that becomes cover for saying we're multicultural because it's commodified inclusion, right? Or it's inclusion on a particular basis. So it's not free movement. It's not, you know, people being able to live and flourish with dignity. It's commodified inclusion, um, which is, you know, uh, being able to enter Canada on certain terms, under certain conditions, and often with the threat of deportation. Um, so, you know, that's really, and Canada, what I think also has cemented Canada's kind of facade of um, multiculturalism is then kind of similar to locally is this global narrative of peacekeeping. So again, a lot of that is in juxtaposition to the United States, but you know, at the United Nations, Canada perfected what is known as the responsibility to protect doctrine. And it's a really kind of imperialism light version of war and empire, right? It's like humanitarian imperialism. You can hear it in the word, like responsibility to protect. It's like seeped in savior ideology. And Canada pioneered this model at the UN, you know, particularly in Somalia in the 1990s. Uh, and then in Libya more recently. And that really is the kind of, you know, quote unquote, failed state doctrine, responsibility to protect, like we're not waging war, we're just sending, you know, peacekeepers, um, even though they're, you know, all the record of Canada's peacekeeping in Somalia in particular, for example, is horrendous, right? Uh, and elsewhere as well. So that's, you know, another way in which that um, narrative has, has, um, has been propped up is that Canada's really just benefited from selling racism as multiculturalism and selling imperialism as responsibility to protect, right? Just kind of creating this the spin doctrine on everything um, and it just has been so uh, smart about it. Mm. Yeah, I agree. And I also think, honestly, that Canada, the government of Canada, Justin Trudeau, great PR team. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, they put up this front or this image that um, for example, like when we mentioned the Syrian refugee crisis, when this was happening, um, Trudeau, you know, would put out these videos where he would talk about um, the fact that we're welcoming all these Syrian refugees and we're welcoming all these people into um, Canadian territories for um, for them to seek asylum. But I, I, like, I think it, it's easy for for people like Justin Trudeau to cater to a certain population of like people who are desperate in desperate need of like a, a safer space to be. Um, and cater to that image of like if oh you're you're looking for safety well we can we can cater to you we can we can give that to you um, and then people come here and face the harsh realities of of, of you know of, of what the government is actually doing and facing the harsh realities that that are not even exposed to these populations who show up and and they, and they think that it's like the lesser of two evils situ uh, a lesser of two evil situation here in Canada um, which I think you know partially contributes to that image as well for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And then there's like, just like you said, the PR team, right? Then there's like those cherry picked news stories yeah. about, you know, Syrian refugees who've made it, which is not to deny any individual's experience. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the narrative being sold is exactly as you point out, like, you know, Canada, the so-called safe haven that masks the kind of inhospitable reality, right? That it's not a welcoming environment that people are struggling. People are struggling with housing. People are struggling with, you know, being able to make it in a labor market that discriminates against them, struggling in the school system, struggling with criminalization, like everything. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there are those singular narratives that, um, that are, uh, that are propped up to make it seem like greatness is happening. And also just even the vernacular and vocabulary of refugees welcome, right? As if the white settler Canada is in any position mm 
to welcome on stolen land, right? Like who becomes the arbiter? Who who is the welcoming? You know, why is Justin Trudeau, uh, as you know, a, a deeply colonial head of state, the one who is offering welcome? Like the ways in which that also in, erases Indigenous nationhood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think uh, another way that you you unveil that multicultural uh, myth so well is when you really break down the temporary foreign worker program and the seasonal agricultural worker program. And we talk about the horrendous conditions that they go through. Um, and some of these cases, uh, and the one that stuck with the three of us a lot was Sheldon McKenzie, you know, coming here 12 years um, as a seasonal agricultural worker, um, you know, suffering a life-threatening injury, being put in a coma only for that for his visa to be stripped and a global campaign being, um, you know, needed for him. Um, you know, we, we were, we just kept talking about, uh, the disposal, like how they see workers as disposable and how they don't see the, um, the, the dignity of his life, especially in that moment. Um, and what we were talking about is, you know, when they're, uh, a, a big bargaining trip that you know workers have is their ability to withhold their labor but when you know they are all constantly being exploited because they they run the risk of being deported how do we organize against this is what our question was and when we have black and brown workers who are blatantly being excluded and disposed of you know through the tfwp sawp how can organizations push against these systems and what is our role in migrant justice um, as people who don't face the risk of deportation every day. Yeah, thank you for that that question. And you know, really, again, this is another one of those ways, as you point out, where it really Canada's um, reality kind of unravels, right? Um, and mm -hmm. I think it's you know important for for folks who may not know, you know, that uh, the largest proportion of people who are coming to Canada is, as you know that broad category of immigrants are actually coming on temporary visas, right? So again, that mm -hmm. myth of like immigration which people assume means like permanent residency you can live here and you know you can become canadian etc that's a myth like it's you know it's quality it's quantitatively a myth let alone of course qualitatively a myth um and most people are coming on these precarious visas as you point out and increasingly even you know international student visas are so precarious for people um and you know in terms of that organizing you know really at the forefront right now is the migrant rights network and i'd like to shout them out because they've been doing so much work and organizing in so many sectors whether that's you know workers on the field or you know domestic workers who are living you know just imagine living in the home of your employer how vulnerable and precarious that is um and you know their demand that i think we all need to amplify is you know again none of those pr slick moves about you know pathway to citizenship or maybe you'll become a permanent resident but really uh the very simple idea that if you're good enough to work you're good enough to stay right that as soon as migrant workers are brought in by employers they have the right to permanent residency from which flows you know the right to unionization to collectively bargain to withhold labor as you mentioned you know to access health care um, and, you know, you mentioned the situation of Sheldon and, you know, it's it's so stark for so many reasons. But one in particular, I think, is that, you know, Canada lauds itself and is known again globally as a provider of universal health care. Um, and, you know, again, this is one of those examples where, again, that myth unravels. Right. Like what does universal health care mean when migrant workers who when they get sick are stripped of their health care and then face medical deportation, right? That that is actually a term, mm -hmm. <laughs> medical deportation, right? When a medical condition leads to your deportation because you are considered not only unable to work, but now you're considered a burden on the healthcare system or the social service net. Um, and I think that is particularly important because um, the kind of migrant worker program, the TFWP also shatters the idea of Canada as this welfare state, right? Like who's able to access social services on what conditions? And we know that, you know, the public education system is rife with systemic racism. And here we see how this is one another example of how the healthcare system is rife with systemic racism, right? And inability to access it. Um, and so I think, you know, it's so important to advocate for migrant workers' rights, uh, not just for like, you know, small reforms, uh, but really to have the horizon in mind, right? Which is that migrant workers have the right uh, to live and work 
in the same ways that citizens do. And that if we really think about it, migrant worker is really just a euphemism. It's another word for third world worker. Like what is a migrant worker? They live in our community. They work in our community. They're our neighbors, right? They share the same neighborhoods as we do, but they're literally segregated, often spatially segregated, right? Like often in compounds that they cannot leave. Um, and that's just a euphemism for third world worker, right? Like the, the, the cheapened labor, the black and brown laborers, as you say, um, to provide, you know, hyper exploitable cheapened labor. So we really need to think about what does it even mean to call someone a migrant worker? I mean, if I, I'm not saying that it's like, it's not a bad word or anything, but to even think about what does it mean in our minds when we consider someone a migrant worker, right? Like, are they not amongst us? Are they not with us? Um, they're in the nation state, but they're not of the nation state, right? Um, so they're already kind of cast in this separate category. So there's a lot that happens with this migrant worker program in terms of the layers of carcerality, the layers of segregation, the layers of exploitation. I mean, again, it's not an anomaly. It's not about one bad employer, you know? It's like this is state-sanctioned exploitation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think it's the state-sanctioned exploitation is, is also something that I think uh, exist in um, other colonial imperial states across the world, settler states. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what it means for settler states to borrow and to use tactics of violence, tactics of exploitation. So in your book, you talked about the, uh, the Catholic, uh, uh system in the Gulf um, and compared it to the temporary foreign workers program. And what does it mean for settler states and colonial and imperial states across the world to borrow tactics of violence to, to exploit workers. Yeah, and I think, you know, that really, as I mentioned earlier, was one of the impetuses for writing this book because it really is like, how can we build a global analysis, which isn't to say everything looks exactly the same everywhere because there's always local nuance and local specificity and local kind of contours and histories. Um, but yeah, just that violence travels, right? Like these systems are global and they're shaped uh, in the fires of settler colonialism, in the fires of empire, in the fires of indentureship, in the, in the fires of enslavement, like all of these are historical trajectories that we can't ignore. Um, and that to me is really what is even frustrating about, you know, this kind of invocation of a new migration crisis. You know, like you mentioned 2015 and that year, you know, when all the media was like, the, the refugee crisis, the migration crisis, the border crisis. And it's like, it is, it's so jarring for this to be called a new crisis when literally for centuries, settlers became settlers mm -hmm. in the millions, you know, by becoming complicit and becoming settlers across the Americas and Oceania, by indentureship, by enslavement, like all of these historical trajectories get erased in this contemporary moment, um, even though those were massive global um, forces. And so the ways in which um, these systems travel, I think, are important. You know, literally, sometimes that travel looks like heads of state sitting in the same room and trading notes, you know, um, like the United States actually borrowing from Canada's temporary foreign worker program. Again, you know, this idea that Canada imports violence from the United States is not always true. In fact, Canada's temporary foreign worker program is now the template at major policy tables globally, you know? So Canada's sitting there kind of selling its model of temporary foreign worker programs as a way for other states, particularly in Europe and the United States, uh, to kind of manage their refugee problem, to manage their border problem. Um, so it's these kinds of policy tables. You know, Australia has perfected what's known as offshore detention, where even before people can even arrive at the border. They just intercept people in boats, literally, and then put them in offshore detention centers so that there's no, that you know, so, so that people literally become not visible. You know, you're in an offshore detention site. Um, and this is, of course, coming to light uh, again. It, it's, you know, it's history repeating itself, but, you know, now in the United States uh, with the, you know, the announcements about the reopening of Guantanamo Bay to intercepted Haitians, you know, Canada does and did the same thing. It intercepts airplanes before people can even make it, you know, so this kind of offshoring, what's called interdiction of intercepting um, migrants and refugees before they even make it to the border is actually one of the main ways that I'm quite concerned about, about violence traveling. Like a lot of times we think about what's happening at the border. Um, but I think the bigger question is like, how are these, you know, these colonial states actually paying increasingly countries in the global south mm 
to become the border guards, right? And so we see now Mexico is getting paid by the United States to stop people coming from Central America. We see the Libyan state and Libyan armed forces are getting paid and Libyan paramilitias, uh, paramilitaries and militias are getting paid to stop migrants and refugees from over 26 countries on the African continent from making it to the Mediterranean, right? And the horrors that we hear about of Libyan detention centers. Um, so the ways in which these, I'd say the, the one other way in which, you know, these settler states, colonial states, imperial states are sharing strategies is that they're actually outsourcing um, their violence, right, to countries in the global south and uh, using whether it's, you know, threat of trade warfare or using all these histories of imperialism to force countries in the global south um, to become complicit and to become the new kind of frontiers of border militarization. And so I think we also have to pay attention to what's happening around the world because the the kind of border walls are no longer just at the sites that we think of, right? It's not I think we've Lost Harsha for, for a bit, but she may come back. Um, yeah, yeah. I guess we'll just play music. Um, oh, there she is. Um, I was rambling, but that was that's where I was ending. Um, I think that was very interesting. It actually brought up um, an extra thought that I was thinking of um, while I was reading this, the book, and it's something that actually um, strikes me. Um, you know, right now you're elaborating on how, um, you know, major countries such as the United States, um, the UK, uh, Mediterranean countries, or even the US use smaller countries or countries with less capital or less power, if there were countries to kind of do that border control for them. Um, there, was a, there was a part of, in, in your book where you discuss um, how within borders, for example, within now so-called Canada, um, the working class is kind of also used used to like uphold um, this this idea of borders within um, Canada and uphold, and uphold border p policing. Uh, and they, border policing kind of becomes inherent to jobs um, like teaching, like nursing. Um, it, would you like to elaborate kind of on that and, and what that looks like? How does Canada kind of like push, um, pits the, the working class against um, each, each other, other um, yeah. in yeah. the of, like border policing, border control? Yeah, that's a great question. And exactly that, right? Like the same way that the that these countries kind of externalize or outsource their borders, they also kind of insource it, which is exactly that, you know, like the struggle for undocumented people or migrants or refugees doesn't end at the border. Once you've crossed the border, you're not suddenly like free of this of border violence. So it looks like, you know, again, returning to the story of Sheldon, where, you know, you're hospitalized in a hospital and suddenly you become subjected to medical deportation because the hospital system and the healthcare system basically turns you in to immigration enforcement. Um, it looks like, you know, teachers uh, potentially, you know, um, snitching for lack of a better word mm -hmm. on their students' immigration status. Social workers, um, you know, social workers, as we know, are a, a massive pipeline to prisons and policing. And social workers are also a pipeline uh, to the deportation, you know, machinery, particularly for youth and care. Uh, you know, where social workers don't all, you know, actively, actively undermine um, youth and care in terms of like accessing their paperwork and ensuring that they uh, are eligible for citizenship and more, you know. Um, so there's all of these kinds of so-called care sectors um, that act as pipelines to deportation. Um, and this is really, again, a trend, I would say, um, in a lot of so-called social welfare states like Canada or the Nordic countries, you know, people always talking about like, you know, how, um, how great it is to be, or how like levels of inequality are lower in welfare states, which of course they are, right? Countries like Canada, Norway, et cetera. But oftentimes a massive gap in that analysis is how the so-called welfare sectors and the so-called care sectors are deeply racist um, and particularly deeply anti-migrant, you know? Uh, in Canada, social housing, you can't access social housing if you're not a permanent resident or citizen, right? Like you actually can't get on a social housing list, for, you know, in the province that I live in, in BC, and I'm pretty sure it's the same across the country. So you're literally bordered out, literally excluded out of a lot of the welfare net that, you know, white Canadians in particular kind of take for granted um, as the social safety net. So that's, you know, one of those ways in which those bordering regimes work. Um, and then, you know, another way in which it, you know, you're, you're your follow-up in terms of how it pits working class people against each other. One way is, of course, that 
working class people who work in these jobs literally become border guards, right? You have like teachers acting like border guards, you have nurses acting like border guards, you have doctors acting like border guards, you have housing workers acting like border guards basically by reporting people based on their immigration status. Um, the other way that I think it pits the working class against each other is again, like by creating categories of people of who belongs and who doesn't, you know? Going back to that example of, of migrant workers, like just even by casting migrant workers as migrant workers as somehow not, you know, workers, but as a separate category of workers, it creates a division. And we hear that a lot, particularly with austerity, right? Because in austerity, austerity is meant, neoliberalism and austerity is meant to make us think um, that there isn't enough, that there's scarcity, right? There's not enough housing, there's not enough childcare spaces, when in fact we know there's enough, it's just that there's the political decisions are to put money into oil and gas and corporations and, you know, bailouts of bosses and into policing and the military, right? Like there's a political decision to not put money into the resources, community controlled resources that we need. And so one of the ways in which that austerity mentality of scarcity works is to suddenly say, oh, well, it's those migrants stealing our jobs. It's the migrants who are causing long health wait lines. You know, it's migrants who are taking our housing. It's migrants who are, you know, scamming the welfare system, all of the kind of scapegoating that happens, then also pits working class people against each other, right? Because to say that migrants, to assume that migrants are being pitted against workers also assumes as if the migrants aren't workers themselves, right? As if they're not also mm -hmm. suffering under the same conditions of austerity or under bosses or under landlords. And so, um, Again, that kind of scapegoating and othering isn't, you know, is is a way in which that division also plays out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think what comes to mind um, for me, especially when 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 you talk about that, is the chapter that you know. And I'm thinking about this again, again, hyper local. You know, Hamilton. We have a really bad um, hate crime, you know, it's the hate crime capital. There's so much um, racism that happens here um, and hate crimes per capita. And, you know, I think I'm thinking about that and how that manifests on the local scale. And then, you know, how you, you know, how you explain that, especially in uh, the global scale and in, in their participation with uh, military uh, spending and trading, especially with Israel and India and having um, those nationalism, uh, right-wing nationalist movements grow not only here in our home here, but, you know, uh, in that, in that connection worldwide. Um, can you tell us like a little bit about that, um, and about that specific relationship between those, uh, three countries, um, and what that was like writing that? Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, similar to uh, the rationale of, you know, thinking about how systems of violence travel when it comes to borders, um, thinking about how particularly right wing nationalisms also travel, you know, and that's like the kind of seeming contradiction, because a lot of nationalisms make it seem like they actually are very local, right? Like the whole point of nationalism is to defend <laughs> this like really anti-indigenous idea of nativism, right? Not nativism in terms of support of indigenous sovereignty, but nativism as a white supremacist kind of force. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like a really particular strand in the United States, right? Where it positions white people as somehow native to land and like they're defending, mm -hmm. you know, they're the victims who are defending their borders, et cetera. Um, and so even though it seems like, you know, it's this kind of parochial, hyper-local idea of, you know, locals defending against the foreign invaders, this is actually a very transnational mm -hmm. phenomenon, right? Exactly, yeah. um, and absolutely, you know, the rise of Zionism, and again, Zionism is always an inherently anti-Palestinian and settler colonial, um, but particularly the rise of Zionism or Hindutva, which is always, and all you know, always Islamophobic, always casteist, and then the rise with Narendra Modi uh, in India, um, you know, really the ways in which the escalation of right wing nationalism relies on, they're all very different, right? They're different in terms of what buttresses them, what escalates them. But there's a lot of things that kind of hold them together, right? Islamophobia is like, is key to many kinds of forms of white supremacy. Anti-blackness is key mm -hmm. to many kinds of, you know, right wing nationalisms. Anti-migrant xenophobia, the idea of the foreign invader, um, who the foreigner is may be slightly different in each context, but really the idea of the foreigner, the demographic threat, um, is, is that similar construction. And so again, to think about 
these ideas um, and how they travel. And I think it's especially important right now because we're also in the Canadian context, you know, the rise of the right is really linked to the anti-vaxxer movement, right? So it can be really easy to say like, oh, you know, there are people who are legitimately anti-vax or who are legitimately vaccine skeptic. That's all true. That is all very true. But we can't ignore that the organized rise of the anti-vax yeah. movement, like the organized, not the individual, is deeply connected to, again, this rise of the right, right? This like hyper individual, like my liberties, I'm the victim mentality. And when we see those connections, it starts to make more sense, right? So in the same way, when we see the when we see uh, how the anti-vax movement, or in an organized way, is you know part and parcel of the rise of white supremacy and the rise of like the incel movement and the rise of right wing mm -hmm. movements in Canada. The same way that if we take that and then map it globally, we start to see certain trajectories, right? So things that may not seem right wing at first because that's how grooming works, right? Mm -hmm. It's not always overt. Um, it takes different forms if we start to see, you know, the spread of false information, misinformation, like training that's happening in Eastern Europe that's bringing together all these men's rights movements, you know, Jordan Patterson types. Right. Um, I think that's why seeing these um, links globally, even as there are differences in each context, becomes important because then it makes it easier for us to know what we're up against, right? Otherwise, it seems like um, we can't always parse it apart, Um and sometimes, you know, and we know mainstream media gives the right wing a lot of cover, makes it seem as if though they're not right wing, right? It makes it seem like, oh, this white supremacist was loved and cared for and was surrounded by their families, right? That kind of garbage. Um, so seeing how right wing ideologies travel, I think also bolsters our movements to know how to fight them better. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. And, I, and when I think about all of the various arms of the state that like, not only perpetuate but actively enforce and push forward the policies and like like these white supremacist like policies uh it becomes overwhelming to think of how to respond to that mm -hmm. when it's mm -hmm. not the, that the courts and the policing are just you know in, um like supporting or perpetuating white supremacy or violence it's that it, it's that they are this the arm of the state that is enforcing mm -hmm. that so when when we uh we were talking about the Aquilinus uh, billionaire family that runs uh, modern day um, like migrant farms and to only be fined $125,000 with a $3.6 billion net worth, it makes us question like, yeah. what does it mean to resist this court system? Um, mm. And does this fine in, in any way signify a win for a movement or mm. is this a sort of just like a harm reduction way of uh, responding to like actual exploitation. Yeah, <laughs> the perennial question. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, you know, I'd say it's like, it's definitely a harm reduction move. Uh, you know, it's, it's like you kind of eke out your victories where you can within the, you know, you're kind of, you know, fighting against the system and constrained by the system, right? Mm -hmm. um, but absolutely, as you point out, like we know so well that the, you know, the policing, every arm of, you know, policing broadly understood, not policing just cops, but policing as an institution, as Ruth Wilson, Gilmore and Mariam Kaba would remind us, right? It's not just the cops. It's like all policing institutions, which has many arms, as you said, um, and, and the courts, like they uphold the status quo, right? Like they will never find enough, which is exactly which is exactly the premise of abolitionist movements, which is that these systems can't be reformed. You can't rely on them for justice. You can't rely on them as survivors. You can't rely on them for hate crimes, right? Like how can you charge someone with a hate crime with a cop who's like the biggest purveyor of hate, right? Like none of it makes any sense. Um, and so absolutely it's, uh, you know, and also a, a, a court system that continuously, continuously undermines indigenous sovereignty, right? Like just the number of court cases time and time again um, that say on the one hand, you know, indigenous rights are important, but a day in, day out, indigenous land defenders are being violated, you know, and, and treaties and unceded lands are being violated. Um, so absolutely, it's like, you know, fighting against that system. Um, but thinking, you know, in the tradition of non-reformist reforms, what are the ways in which we can break that system apart, right? Like not advocating for reforms that entrench the system, but what are reforms or victories that are forcing either the contradiction of the system open or forcing something out of that system, right? Um, 
And so that's absolutely, you know, on the ground, organizers make those calls all the time um, and figure that out, you know, based on their context about which fight they want to take up and which fight uh, makes sense in their context mm -hmm. uh, in the kind of, you know, as part of that horizon. And so with the Aquilinis, the farm workers who were involved used it strategically to make a bigger point, right? Like the victory, the, the, the tactic was certainly to take the Aquilinis to court and to get a fine, but it was a way to lay bare in the media and to the public about what's happening, right? About how capitalism accumulates wealth on the back, on the back of precarious and exploited labor, right? Like that, that was the ultimate goal is to make visible what's supposed to stay invisible. Mm -hmm. um, and before I ask the next question, I just want to let people know, whoever is um, currently watching, if you guys have any questions. Sorry, you froze for me. Oh. Have, is that okay? Is it okay now? Hello? Marsha? Can you hear us? Can, can, oh. I think Harsha's connection is coming out. Um, yeah, I guess so in the meantime, uh, for those watching, feel free to leave questions in um, the comment section on Facebook or as comments under the Twitter um, post as well, and we will uh, any questions that you have for Harsha, and, and then we can include them at the end of the session. Is, is it better now? Yes, yeah, sorry, I don't know if you heard me, but I was like, you froze for me, I don't know what you're saying. Uh, I just, I invited everybody to ask questions in the comments if you had any, um, before I kind of um, segue on to the next question that we had here, and you, um, you know, a good way to, to segue is just because you were mentioning, um, I guess, again, in the Canadian context, um, and how Canada kind of enacts borders. Um, you know, we were, I, I was reading the book and, and also thinking about the way in which that, uh, the way in which Canada enacts um, borders within the lines um, with regards to indigenous populations, for example, and the way in which we, uh, like the, the state actively tries to other um, indigenous populations on reserves by limiting access to basic necessities like water, for example, um, or even access to indigeneity itself if they leave reserves. Um, and of course, the disproportionate amount of indigenous people in the in the prison system, um, in the foster care system, et cetera, right? So this is um, all kind of ways in which Canada enacts borders, right, within within the lines. Yeah. Um, can you speak to how the creation of borders, I guess, hinders on the struggle for indigenous sovereignty, both within yeah. so-called Canada and, I guess, at a global scale? Because we also know that similar struggles um, happen a, a, around the world with with um, indigenous populations and borders, um, you know, in Kashmir, for example, mm -hmm. or even um, at the Chadian Sunni's border, you mentioned uh, a, a Zavawa refugee, and I'm actually also Zavawa, which is really interesting for me to read about in the book, um, and, and kind of how borders um, alienate indigenous populations all across the world. Do you want to kind of give um, a spiel on, on that or a comment on that? Thank you for your brilliant spiel. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I think one of the um, one of the ways in which migrant justice struggles are often kind of pitted against indigenous struggles is this idea of like, um, you know, the idea that migrant and indigenous are inherently kind of contradictory ideas, right? Uh, which really ignores the fact, as you point out, that borders were actually a tool not of indigeneity or indigenous peoples, it's a tool of colonization and empire, mm -hmm. which isn't to say that indigenous people don't have rights to self-determination and sovereignty, but it's not about the border the way that it exists, right? Like the border is inseparable. The border is not like a line on a map. It's inseparable from capital and power uh, and imperialism. And so um, that's so vital to understand because there's you know almost no border on the map today that hasn't been made as a result of empire. There's almost none, right? We're not following the borders of natural law, right? These are like deeply colonial borders, as you point out, mm -hmm. um, that you know arbitrarily separate uh, communities from each other, right? Including and especially indigenous communities from each other around the world. Um, and one example that I often give um, is actually, you know, I mentioned earlier the Wet'suwet'en Nation. And the Wet'suwet'en Nation, when you enter their territory, you get asked a number of questions. You get asked, why are you here? How does your, uh, I'm paraphrasing, I should say, you know, why are you here? Um, how does your visit benefit the community and the nation? Uh, and do you work for industry or the state, right? Right. 
And a lot of times I get people asking me like, oh, but you know, why are you okay with that? Isn't that a border checkpoint? I'm like, no, that's not at all a border checkpoint. That is like a community asserting its right to self-determination that is asking, that is actually explicitly anti-capital and anti-state, right? Like explicitly asking, are you cap, are you working for industry or do you work for the state? Which is like the opposite of the nation state's borders that we know of, which work in the interest of the state and capital, right? That's like a non-capitalist anti-state position. And for me, it's actually very similar to the analogy of, you know, when people are like, oh, you're anti-prisons, you must not believe in like any justice. It's like, well, no, community accountability is a very different concept than prisons and police, right? And so to me, when indigenous people are affirming self-determination and, you know, have that kind of free prior to informed consent protocol, like it with Sowetan, that's not a border checkpoint. That's actually accountability. Um, so to me, the kind of ways in which, um, indigenous kind of sovereignty is assumed to mean like a pro port, a pro border position is not the case, right? Like self-determination and sovereignty are not the same uh, as people affirming their rights to self-determination. And in fact, borders work against indigenous peoples. And like you brilliantly pointed out, like the entire system of reservations and reserves in the United States and Canada is a bordering regime. It's like intended literally to contain indigenous people. And, you know, Arthur Manuel, the late great Shaquatmuk leader, he wrote about how, you know, Canada's reserve system was intended to put indigenous people onto less than 1% of the of their land base. Reserves are less than 1% of Canada's land base. So it's a way to corral, contain, you know, a form of carcerality, of containment of indigenous people to not have access to their territories, as you pointed out, right? Like it's, to, it's an internal bordering regime of settler colonialism. And so absolutely, I think, you know, borders and bordering regimes are systems of ordering and containment that work against indigenous sovereignty, in my view. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a question that comes in from the chat that says, how do you think grassroots movements can grow and sustain themselves to develop their own systems and institutions that support their community and power yeah. to undermine capitalist infrastructure. Oh, such a good question. <laughs> um, it's you know, it's a it's a hard one. Um, it's a hard one, and it's hard to say. You know, there isn't one explicit answer, and I will you know give the roundabout answer of saying that I don't think there's one particular way. I, but I do think that it really is building autonomy, right? Like just to, for us to all get clear, we may all be clear on this call, but I don't know to what degree that we can't reform capitalism. We can't reform carceral institutions. We can't reform policing. We can't reform borders. Uh, and so even getting to the point where we're all agree on that is like the first step, right? Because a lot of movement time and energy is spent on these kinds of debates, right? About where to fight. Uh, and, on, and under what terms and you know where to fight is a separate question but if we believe that we can change the system versus you know like i mentioned earlier for fighting for some kind of victory within a system but understand that strategically that's a different question um and how can we develop our own systems and institutions you know there's so many different ways you know really supporting land defenders who are at the front line of undermining colonial capitalism right like there are so many land defense struggles, wherever we are, there's a struggle, right? So to throw down and support. Um, also, you know, challenging and undermining and defunding the police does undermine capitalist infrastructure because that's what the cops are. They're the enforcers of capitalism. You know, fights against gentrification undermine capitalist infrastructure. Uh, you know, fights for people who are unhoused or homeless, right? Like homelessness is a product of capitalism. It has nothing to do with people's, uh, you know, the kind of idea of individualism, right? That if you fail in life, you become homeless or you become poor. No, poverty is a consequence of capitalism. It's an enforced poverty. It's not natural. It's not inherent. So like we live in a system where there are many front lines of capitalist infrastructure. Um, and that goes, you know, again, from fighting struggles alongside indigenous land defenders supporting black and racialized communities against policing, supporting struggles against the border, supporting temporary foreign workers, migrant workers, you know, fights against evictions. These are all ways in which we can build power to undermine capitalist infrastructure. Um, and I think the one thing, you know, sometimes it can be overwhelming 
to think about the number of fights that there are, right? Like it would be easier to be like, just recycle <laughs> and you'll undermine capitalism. It's not going to work. And so the fight is bigger and that can be overwhelming. But for me, I'm a, I'm a Gemini. So um, <laughs> the other half of my brain is like, you know, but the system's like one big fucking knot, right? Like it's one big, it's a ma it's a massive knot. It's not a small one. It's a big one. But if you start to unravel it, it will fall apart. So whichever strand we pick up will unravel the system. Um, and I think that's, that's the other piece to keep in mind, right? It can be overwhelming, but it is one giant shit show. So in as much as we can unravel any part of it, I'm sorry, I don't know if it's okay to swear. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, in as much as we can take some of that, right. Um, and, and do that, that that's a big part of it. And um, yeah, you know, and building that power. And I think a big part of building power is the struggle of knowing how to be with other people in struggle, you know, Mm -hmm. um, the power that we build on the street, the power that we build. And I don't mean just the street, physically street. I know, you know, we organize in different ways, but just the ability to come together and break the isolation and neoliberalism that the system wants us to believe uh, is natural. That's a big part of how we create alternatives too, right? Is by actively, actively and actually coming together in resistance in whatever form it is. That's also building alternatives because then we start to imagine. We imagine other ways of being, other ways of living, uh, and that keeping that imagination alive is a big part of it as well. Yeah, and there are there are examples of this. I think uh, you mentioned a couple ways to, to, to um, uh, sort of watch capitalism fail, but there are groups like, uh, or regions like the Chiapas, uh, the, the, the Zapatistas in uh, Mexico, who are living this reality, who are disrupting capitalism, who are building their own community groups, building decentralized communities and governing themselves. Um, and there are many uh, clear examples of this, I think, around the world that can help us understand what it means to build our own communities here in this moment as we, until we eventually do uh, abolish capitalism. Yeah, Zapatistas are a wonderful example. Thank you for lifting them up. Okay. Yeah. What uh, what we wanted to you know to ask we we had a couple questions um, and and I think you actually like knocked them out of the park I, I don't think that we need to go over them again you know talking about the connection and the um, that symbiotic relationship of you know prisons and borders and you know racist nationalism and how they they work together like cogs and machine to you know oppress us um, and so I I think the question that we wanted to ask you. So uh, very importantly, is, you know, what does it mean to write this book, especially at this particular moment in time? You know, you're talking about all of these things that are happening. And while we while we read the book, you know, we couldn't stop talking about that deep intrinsic violence with the nationalism and states. And so we wanted to know first, like what writing the book meant to you as a person who was involved in the struggle, as a person who was organizing um, and especially in what seems like a moment of global resistance, but not only just that of global struggle um, and global turmoil together um, and what that meant to you. Um, and that was, you know, one of the questions that we wanted to yeah. end off on and uh, what that process was like, because um, it, it, this book is so important, especially right now. And we wanted to know uh, what that was like. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I won't I won't say on that that earlier piece that you mentioned about prisons and borders and their connection, but maybe I can just offer a quote because uh, mm -hmm, it's, absolutely. It's, I, think it's, I think it's a good one. Um, Angela Davis wrote a piece with Gina Dent in the early 2000s about prisons. And in that she wrote um, about how the prison is a border. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, I think is really salient because, you know, if the prison is a border, we can by extension say the border is a prison. And I think, those connections about how prisons and borders and, you know, like you said earlier about reservations and reserves, like all of these systems and the temporary foreign worker program all act in similar ways if we think of carcerality, right? Like carcerality more broadly. Um, but I, I think writing this book, yeah, I mean, the thing with writing is you always write way before it comes out, you know? So there's a, there's a, there's a strange thing that happens there. Um, but I was really uh, wanting to write um, to counter liberalism, you know, 
uh, really this moment where Trudeau was like at a high, you know, I think he's crashed now. Thankfully, people are, are um, you know, pre-pandemic, a lot of that uh, is unraveling in terms of the, you know, like we said, refugees welcome, you know, or this guy who's a climate champion, but buys pipelines, like, that's how liberalism works. Um, and also in the United States, where people were, uh, this was before Trump was elected out, but you could, you got that sense in the United States that people were um, cheering on the possibility of a democratic presidency, which is now, of course, in place. And so, um, really wanting to write about the pitfalls of liberalism, um, particularly uh, as movements are on the rise, because, you know, so that's that's where movements can go, not to suggest they have to go there or that they have all gone there. But that can become a pitfall, uh, is the co-optation of liberalism, mm -hmm. is the ways in which, you know, they get, um, you know, capitalism co-ops, the state co-ops, liberalism co-ops, branding happens, all kinds of ways in which it happens, or, you know, uh, reformist reforms start to take root. Um, so I was, I was writing in a moment um, where that was a piece that I wanted to take on, particularly in the context of thinking about borders. Um, and again, globally, right? Because that's also what was happening in Europe mm -hmm. um, in the kind of post-2015 moment. Um, and so the book came out later <laughs> than when I wrote it. Um, and it's just, it's been so invigorating to know that we are in a place where we are thinking in, you know, with the horizon of revolution, thinking on the horizon of liberation, thinking on the horizon of abolition, um, where most most people and really hands raised here to like young folks, right? Um, who are who understand intrinsically how the system is rotten. Like it just comes down to that. The system is rotten. It was intended this way. Um, and who aren't, who, you know, don't have kind of like, who aren't swayed by the false promises of liberalism. And so, um, I think that's deeply encouraging. It is so deeply encouraging. Thank you. Thank you so much for Thank you. being here and answering our questions and having this, this discussion with us. I think um, this book, honestly, one of the best reads I've ever read. And honestly, it's just abundance of knowledge. And I was taking in all, mm -hmm. taking in all this information and I was like, whoa, like the entire time. So thank you so much for, for being here with us and answering our questions. Um, we really appreciate it, and and, and yeah, it, 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 it really helps us uh, situate ourselves in this moment in our or, uh, organizing here locally against mm -hmm. policing, against like really like mean council, uh, against um, yeah, and so it's it, it's really really helpful to, to see all, all the pieces connect globally. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, and I'm we're all just like very very thankful that you. Uh, took the time. It's been an honor to be able to, you know, ask you questions and pick your brain for this hour. Um, so thank you so much, Archa. Thank you. I just really want to say it's an honor for me to be here. I have so much admiration from afar for all the incredible organizing that you all are doing. Uh, and really, you know, learning is mutual. So thank you for your brilliant exchange and everything that you've offered this conversation. I'm so truly humbled and cheerleading you all always. Thank you. Thank you. We want to thank everybody who's watching. You. If you're still here, um, thank you, uh, everyone who's uh, tuned in today. Um, we all of this video and conversation with Harsha will be recorded and posted. Um, should you want to share it again? Um, and please follow Harsha if you're still here. Uh, Harsha Walia Eight on Instagram. Um, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.